You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me this week are Jeff Branke and Anna Wells. We each have more than 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five most popular stories on our websites and discuss the implications they have on the industry going forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IEN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. We're also live every Friday, so make sure to subscribe to at IEN Magazine on YouTube to make sure you get a notification and you can join us live. Anna, how are you doing this week? Doing fine, thanks. How are you? I am pumped you know we're doing it like right in the mid-afternoon we wanted to get out a little bit earlier but uh not as early as last week because we're short-staffed it's not my fault we're short-staffed it's definitely not your fault definitely not my fault you didn't drive people towards vacation they just needed to get away i wasn't you you know they just they need to get away from me (laughs) but i didn't drive them you know Okay, so it's a complicated dance. (laughs) (laughs) How are you doing this week, Jeff? I am great, man. Very good. All right. Well, before we get started, we have a word from our new sponsor, Red Zone. Manufacturers are facing extraordinary challenges today with labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and a changing workforce. Complex industrial technology doesn't cut it on the front line. What's needed is a new way of working that will not only meet throughput goals, but change the shop floor culture to one of winning, where every worker feels they play a part in achieving the company's goals for success. What's needed is Red Zone, the connected workforce solution. And we're back. Red Zone's connected workforce software solution enables manufacturers to empower frontline teams in production, maintenance, and quality to contribute their full potential and achieve company goals around productivity and throughput. Red Zone software enables manufacturers, big and small, to boost their plant's productivity, increase employee engagement, and lower turnover. Anna, those are all good things. All good things. Yeah, positive, Jeff. Very positive. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's jump into our first story this week. Samsung could build 11 chip plants in Texas. Everything is bigger in Texas, including Samsung's plans for the Lone Star State. The company recently filed documents seeking tax breaks on 11 potential chip plants that would cost more than $190 billion. The South Korean company already has a chip factory in Texas and is currently building another one. The new plants would cost between $12 billion and $23 billion each and create some 900 new jobs each. Nothing is set in stone, and these applications are part of a long-term planning process. Jeff, I mean, Samsung was definitely going bigger going home with this one. <laughs> yeah, pretty interesting that they'd come out. I don't think it's coincidental. This came out within days of the uh, passing of the big chips bill that yeah. came out in support yeah. of potentially trying to get more um, chip manufacturing here in the U.S., something like $50 billion yeah. um, to try to lure and attract more of that manufacturing here. I think it was a smart move by Samsung. Really, when you think about it, they've already made a commitment for one of them. They're just kind of putting their name out there, right, saying, hey, we're... Like you always say when we're rounding third base in softball, think about it. Think about it. Think yeah. about it. You know, we're here. I think the fact that they are a South Korean country also kind of gives them a leg up. I think a lot of some of the semiconductor folks coming from Taiwan and other places where there isn't as much of a, where there is a bit of a political issue potentially, um, also potentially gives them a leg up. Hmm. Um, again, I think it was just a smart move by them. We've, they've already got the one they're doing in Texas saying, hey, we're out here too. That fifty billion, you know, we're thinking about one ninety. So yeah. we're going to send some of that our way. Maybe they can get a bigger chunk of that by being one of the first to the party, so to speak. Yes, the flood of free money is coming, yeah. <laughs> and everyone's got a bucket out. Um, Anna, your thoughts on uh, Samsung's, let's say, ambitious plans that would, you know, just bring just about nine thousand nine hundred new employees online in Texas? Easy. <laughs> you just put a vision in my head of like. Um, executives for major companies in one of those wind machines with all the dollars. Oh, yeah. They were <laughs> like grabbing just, that's what I is, picture is happening right now. That is what's happening now, metaphorically. <laughs> metaphorically. Yeah. Um, yeah, to me, this is a little bit of a weird scenario because it is so speculative. Um, like Samsung said that 
they actually don't have any specific plans, right. as you mentioned. Um, but it sounds like obviously they're trying to get in front of a deadline for this state run program mm -hmm. called Chapter 313 that deals with property tax incentives. So I get that that stuff kind of helps them evaluate viability. But you do wonder when a company puts the cart before the horse, so <laughs> to speak, um, you know, it, like in this case, maybe they feel a bit forced to in order to leverage this incentives program. So I'm not saying anything about S Samsung, but mm -hmm. I do think it could start a little bit of a bidding war that we've seen this in so many cases, right? Where multiple states come in, they come to the table to try to outdo one another. And in my opinion, and we've discussed this before, I think that kind of stuff might change the discussion around due diligence for these manufacturers um, who get these sweetheart deals and then they barely have any skin in the game and then they're more tempted maybe to roll the dice and see what happens. That's just my opinion. Yeah, no, um, I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's the case here necessarily, but we do know there's a market for U.S. chip production. So obviously there's like, you know, an incentive to do this anyway, um, as well as, as you mentioned, some federal government help coming down the line here. But I also wouldn't say it's out of the question that the companies that can take advantage of these motivated like economic lifelines do so. And then a few years down the road, maybe we have an oversupply. We don't know. I mean, okay. that certainly could happen here. We've seen it happen in so many other cases. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out and if other states get on board to try to push Samsung in one direction or the other. 11 chip plants seems like a lot <laughs> for Texas. Yeah. yeah. 11 more chip plants. But no, uh, talking about due diligence on the manufacturer's part, you know, I think you start hearing numbers like $200 billion. And mm -hmm. the due diligence on the state's part also kind of falls alongside the road. They, people get stars in their eyes. Yeah, yeah oh, I yeah. agree. Uh, so it's, as you said, Chapter 313 is one of Texas's most valuable tax incentives programs. And it's going to expire at the end of uh, December 31st, 2022. And it reduces school district property taxes for capital intensive facilities to try and, you know, attract this type of economic development. Um, some have argued that the government should not spend billions to subsidize the semiconductor industry, an industry that, you know, quote, does not need any additional government handouts, talking about the CHIPS program now. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of times it seems like the government has a tough time picking winners and losers. And uh, I've always, uh, I don't know, I kind of feel like I'm on the fence with this because I understand the need for the incentives, right? Because mm -hmm. we got to be competitive. But I also think that it's easy for the government to go a little too far trying to find pick a winner. And, uh, you know, that by the time that happens, there's so much skin in the game that, you know, when things go bad, everyone's kind of like tied to it. You know, they can't ban yeah. them. No, I totally agree. It is a tough one because you want to be competitive. You want to get, you know, this whole everything with the pandemic. We want our supply chains closer to home. Yeah. And we're so dependent on these chips. It's kind of interesting, you know, looking at the different market segments. I think there's obviously areas that we are very well become very well versed in terms of the shortages like automotive mm -hmm. but and obviously computing mobile devices all of that what's kind of interesting looking at some of the numbers and this is for actually from ieee the industrial sector actually spends more annually on uh, sourcing chips mm -hmm. than automotive mm -hmm. so when you look at all the stuff that we need for automated equipment within our factories and within manufacturing that's a big need there as well and that's where i do get excited when we look at some of these chip manufacturers coming here providing incentives for them because it will help all facets of manufacturing, including mm -hmm. the actual stuff we need to make the stuff. Yeah. So I, I get it there. It is scary when you're looking at this big of a pie, though, yeah. to, to potentially divvy out to people. Well, and it's just, you know, in good American tradition to, you know, do something about a year and a half too late and then but really come over the top to overcompensate. Well, to have unreasonable expectations. And I think we've talked about this a number of times. It's great to build these plants. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to have an impact for Three, four, five years. years. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah. All right. Our next most popular story this week. Ukraine deploys homegrown machine gun mounted robot. That sounded like a Mad Lib. <laughs> All right. The GNOM, or GNOME as I'm going to call it, is an uncrewed ground vehicle made by Ukraine-based Termerland. The two square foot remote controlled unit is being used to support ground troops in the war with Russia. One of the GNOME's key features is that it's not as susceptible to the frequency jamming countermeasures that have impacted drone use during the Russian invasion. It has a spool of wear-resistant fiber optic cable that it spools out behind it, enabling more reliable control and communication. 
The 110-pound gnome can deliver ammunition and supplies and collect and share data using a camera mounted to a telescope mast, telescopic mast that can record images from up to three miles away. The application that's getting the most attention is that it has a 762mm machine gun mounted to it. While remote controls for guns or wheeled devices are not new, the combination of the two is in a combat environment is what's innovative here. The biggest concern for military leaders is how to use these armed UGVs alongside troops. They also need to dedicate personnel to operate the device and properly fire the weapon. Ideally, the lessons learned in Ukraine can one day provide support for law enforcement, disaster relief, and transporting medical supplies. And Jeff, that's what I'm holding on to is what it can become and not how it's being used currently in war. Well, and it's interesting because when you look at it, are we going with, is it Temerland? Is that how we're saying that? Or Temerland? Oh, it's Temerland. Temerland, yeah. okay. okay. The U- Ukrainian um, manufacturer of these things. If you look at their site and the different offerings that they have, they're not really meant to, their, their first application is not for armed support, okay, to provide fire support. So it, that's what they've done. Obviously, desperate times create desperate measures, and, and this is what we're seeing. From a tact- purely tactical perspective, it will be interesting to see how this sort of plays out because obviously infantry troops don't move in straight lines across open fields. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're maneuvering these um, these um, um, units through some interesting terrain, especially if you're in an urban environment, a lot of urban warfare going on right now, and making sure there's no friendly fire casualties and trying to remove people from the combat zone. You're not creating more potentially with somebody operating a machine gun and they don't have a clear field of vision of, of sight of where it's firing. So I would think from a tactical perspective where these could be great is in terms of like setting up for an ambush or putting a gun in place and being able to fire it that way. Um, you know, these guns, typically you're looking at about a 25 pound gun with about 10 to 15 pounds of ammo. So if you don't have to carry that, mm-hmm. that is great. Yeah, mm-hmm. And that sort of leads into what you were talking about there in terms of what these were initially created for. Yeah, They're really meant as transport units. They're really meant, actually, one of the biggest applications for them is for communication purposes, to almost serve yeah. as if you were like a satellite hotspot. Oh, yeah. That's one of the main things that they were developed for. For like reconnaissance? Sure. Right. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so you can see where the, even one of these units, it's kind of funny, looking at the Scorpio II specifically, and it's got a big turreted machine gun on the front of it. It looks like something out of, I don't know, Transformers or something. Yeah. It's actually one of the applications is for tilling fields. Oh, really? I mean, so you can That's see, not the vibe you get when you see the no, Scorpio too. Not at all. It, it's not an agricultural vehicle by by looking at it, but that is that's where these came from. And like you alluded to, hopefully that's where we can get back to. Yeah. Is it tethered? It it's either. Oh, okay. so it can be tethered with that fiber optic cable. That's why it's good for intel um, gathering intelligence and doing reconnaissance work. It's yeah. got that great camera on it. Yeah. With, uh, the telescoping um, turret. So that's what it, they can be do that, but they also have autonomous functionality as well. Okay. That was the one, that was the only sticking point for me is I was like, oh, well, if it's tethered uh, and it's probably not going to be able to go very far. And then when you were talking about additional um, uses for it, like transporting medical supplies during a disaster, I'm like, well, you're not going to get over anything if it's tethered. But I guess if it can operate, you know, uh, without that, that'd be much better. Um, What were your thoughts on the GNOME? Uh, You know, I think Jeff covered a lot of the high points on the gnome, as did you, Um, you know, safety being a big one. And I think it's important to be clear, too, as we talk about this is, you you know, when you see like terms like machine gun mounted robot, you my mind jumps to like autonomous and fears of like this being autonomously fired and, mm-hmm. you know, all the ramifications of, of that. That's not the case here. This is a remote gunner, right, who's taking the shot. So um, it, it's not easily getting out of your control. It's not one of those scary military developments where you are have to be worried that, about it getting into the wrong hands and what it could mean for the future. Um, and in fact, I, I think like almost more controllable than a, a drone potentially. Mm-hmm. And it has those benefits. Um, a, a, You know, in addition that the drones face challenges with like those jammers and the radio frequencies, this doesn't have to deal with that. So it's not detected and targeted in the same way. Um, So, yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, it's generating a lot of headlines for the machine gun part. But as you Mm -hmm. mentioned, like, you know, really the key applications here could be just delivering those supplies to the front lines, keeping soldiers out of harm's way who don't need to physically be doing that. Like that's a really important development, I think, for Ukraine. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it's a really durable unit. It's 110 pounds. It's got yeah. the all-terrain tires on it, all that kind of stuff. So disaster relief, all of those types of applications too. And ideally, I mean, if it can survive a war zone, you'd think they'd be able to shore it up from a product development perspective yeah. to handle almost anything. Yeah. Innovation from wartime has been <laughs> consistent with the, you know, uh, all uh, the entire time of man. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I still feel for the troop who's behind the wheel of that thing because, you know, that has to just be an emotionally taxing job to be yeah. the person remotely controlling that gun. Um, all right. Well, our next most popular story this week. Chipotle enlists hidden robot army to build burritos. <laughs> Chipotle wants to have 7,000 restaurants in North America. Right now, there are 3,008. To more than double, the company is adding robots to the workforce. This week, the company invested in Hyphen, a California-based company that makes food production robotics. Hyphen's first product is the MakeLine, an automated system that can handle all digital orders under the counter out of the view of customers while staff continue to assemble in-house orders on top of the counter. Hyphen features thousands of sensors and uses AI to make sure orders are put together correctly. The machine also prints the customer's names and orders directly on the packaging. And for Hyphen, the Chipotle investment will allow it to accelerate hiring plans, pouring money into R&D, and scaling operations. Anna, as long as your burrito's right... Do you mind if it was made by man or machine? What are the odds this robot's going to get your your name right on the package? I I, oh, it's going to because pervert. it's going to take it. It's going to take it. I mean, I think there's a lot of fun to be had here. Yeah. Because you know, uh, I have a lot of fun with the names that you put on that order for carryout. Yeah. And I mean, oh, you're that guy. Of course, I'm that guy. You know me. Um, <laughs> and I just you know, especially once it starts burning the names onto the paper. See more butts. Uh, Your no, burritos no, no. ready? <laughs> That's going to be the first order. They're going to have to like hold it up like, we've done it. Hyphen has made the first order for see more butts. See more so. butts. Yeah. <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> Beep boop. Uh, <laughs> robots don't do that, I don't think. Um, I don't know. I, I This is an interesting story because I feel like there was a lot of fear and concern around robots and applications that were coming from manufacturing and this idea that they were going to dipl- displace a ton of workers in manufacturing. We, if you look at the data, that hasn't really happened mm-hmm. in manufacturing. Um, there's been a lot of development, I think, of robotics, automation, cobots in manufacturing, but more like working alongside of um, you know existing personnel and sort of supplementing that process. But where we have seen robots come in and I think be more of a threat to Jobs is in settings like warehouse, grocery, fast food, Mm -hmm. where the applications might be a little bit more straightforward. Because the reality, I think, in many manufacturing processes is they really are mostly more low volume, um, a little bit more nuanced um, than just these repetitive tasks that people have in their minds of what manufacturing is, more value add. But now you see, you know, White Castle's using a robot um, Mm -hmm. from Miso Robotics to flip burgers to drop fryers. Um, Jamba Juice has a robot smoothie um, maker kiosk Mm -hmm. uh, at some locations. (laughs) Panera is using automated coffee making machines that are driven by artificial intelligence. Um, That's just a handful of the applications that we're seeing in fast food. And honestly, there is a need right now um, when the job market is so uneven and these restaurants are really limited on staffing. Uh, they've been struggling to attain a consistent workforce. We've all seen it walking up to a door and seeing that the hours have changed on a, a restaurant that used to be open all the time now yeah. is cutting back because of workforce issues. So, um, you know, I think these businesses are clearly seeing that opportunity that if they want to incorporate automation into their operations without a massive backlash Mm -hmm. (laughs) that you might have seen a few years back now is precisely that time, in my opinion. I mean, like you can blame it on the worker shortage and never look back. I mean, when this uh, job market shifts, which it inevitably inevitably will, Mm -hmm. um, this will already be embedded in their process. And we'll look back and we'll talk about that time when jobs were permanently eliminated during this economic boom that we saw post COVID. I truly believe that that will happen. Oh, yeah. And you know, you saw like, if this happened a couple of years back, people would be, I mean, people were angry. I think when, when like even some of those 
ordering kiosks started to show up at like yeah. Subway and McDonald's and stuff. What's happening to jobs? People were mad about self-checkout. Like, um, but, but now it's like, if you want to go to Walmart or whatever and get your product through, they have like one, two checkers on because that's all they can do. Um, mm -hmm. they have, you know, I, our local Walmart by our office, like they've implemented, I like probably 10 times the number of self checkout stations as they had before mm -hmm. the pandemic. And I think that it's related to workers, but it's also, like I said, a good time for them to do that without facing a lot of, oh, yeah. of, uh, revolt, I guess, from the mm -hmm. general public saying that they're cutting jobs in favor of automation. Yeah. Uh, you did, uh, I like that you mentioned, uh, the white castle robot, which is called flippy flippy, yep. flippy uh, <laughs> from Mesa robotics. It's, and what I was shocked about is that's already in 300 white castles. Flipping burgers and dropping fries uh, because Chipotle, I learned about Flippy because Chipotle actually recently unveiled Chippy. Yeah. Yeah. The robot from uh, also from Miso that's making tortilla chips and is part of a pilot program right now. So I thought, you know, maybe it was a little bit more green. But then to see that they're in 300 locations in White Castle, that's incredible. The fact yeah. that there are 300 White Castles at all is what I'm surprised by. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. Really? Oh, that, yeah. That's your thing? I mean, I don't go to, I just, you see so many of them. I guess I assume yeah. there was at least that many. Maybe, I went I, to, maybe um, they're white noise to me at this point. I just, like, <laughs> I mean, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I went to a white castle once after the movie came out and I was like, I don't get it. Pretty Squ underwhelming. Yeah. 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 Square yeah. burger. Like, all right. It's all about the burger and this is trash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff. Uh, your thoughts on robots in the kitchen? Yeah, I think you guys have already mentioned. I think there's a, definitely a cobot vibe here, yeah. the term that we're in the industrial sector with. So it's, I think it's cool to see this coming in. And I think some of the other applications this could lead to as well. If you look at pharmacy, you'd think this type of thing could mm -hmm. also fit pretty well there. Those folks are super understaffed right now. I mean, getting a prescription filled takes a while now to, yeah. when you go there. It makes you feel bad for them. I mean, they're just swamps back mm -hmm. there running around. Um, one thing that I, a couple of things I like just about the setup that uh, that hyphen has here it's got a modular design mm -hmm. so you can kind of plug and play with however much you need thinking down the road you could also see like in schools or cafeteria environments having this type of setup that could be huge in terms of saving time getting kids fed sooner um i don't know maybe cutting personnel out a little <laughs> bit if you didn't need them or having trouble finding them yeah the other thing i like that was kind of cool is they use a robotics as a service pricing model so there's no huge upfront cost oh. associated with mm -hmm. it, which I think is pretty smart. I mean, if you're trying to get it in here and they charge based on the number of meals that the robot actually prepares and serves. Oh, interesting. So yeah, I think it's um, really smart in a number of different ways. Like I said, great design. It's, it meets all the codes, obviously for food service. It's stainless steel, easy to clean, all that good stuff. So product development perspective, I think they nailed it. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see just from an integration perspective, how far this goes and how far to Anna's point, people feel comfortable with it. Yeah. One of the things that I started thinking about, and I'll ask you guys, and maybe I'm being overly optimistic here when it comes to manufacturing, but if potentially there are fewer jobs in fast food, um, food service, that type of thing with Starbucks and other places like Chipotle, will that potentially drive people more towards looking at manufacturing jobs? Mm -hmm. Because if, they're, if they don't have, you know, it might be more palatable, if you will, if there's still some of those stigmas involved with manufacturing being, I've got to go to a factory, I got to work on the plant floor, it's hot, it's dirty, which we know is not the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to sitting in air conditioning making coffee. Yeah. You know, maybe that's maybe some of these developments could actually help quell some of the workforce demands in other areas like manufacturing. I don't know. No, absolutely. I think, I mean, right now we see that there's a finite pool of labor out there that's willing to work. And, uh, you know, if, automation comes in and removes a lot of those jobs from fast food, I think manufacturing would be, if a lot of those jobs haven't been removed in manufacturing as a result of automation, I think manufacturing would be a good fit. How about you, Anna? Well, y yes, potentially. Um, you know, I also find it interesting that when Walmart started incorporating a lot of uh, robots into its stores for inventory purposes and um, cleaning applications and things like that, that there was some articles that came out um, after that that expressed some discontent on behalf of Walmart's employees about working alongside of robots. Mm -hmm. Not just that it was um, creepy, I guess, but also um, that it was sort of demoralizing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know if, if in these applications where you don't maybe expect a robot to be there and when you took that job, you weren't expecting that and now it's there. 
if that will have any impact on those types of scenarios as well as they did in retail. No, I think, uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, to your point earlier about the screens, uh, the ordering screens, screens at like McDonald's and Subway, yeah. I think we've already begun to see the impact those have because when you go into the restaurant to order on a screen, like they almost laugh at you if you walk up to the counter, like, and they'll kind of walk away, you know, just like the screen, you know, mm -hmm. the screen. And so as a result, if that is my ex new experience now in the restaurant, I would much rather it just be robots back there. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's just... I think this is the future, not just, you know, we always talk about lights, uh, trying to attain lights out manufacturing, but I think that we'll likely see lights out fast food faster. Um, that sounds awful though. It does, you don't but think like, like it having doesn't, it doesn't, any, it doesn't any humans in there to like figure out what's going on when you have a problem. You think a robot's going to solve your problem? I think, it, I think it could. I mean, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, uh, actually I was the one least comfortable about ordering a burger off, a. You know, essentially a red box. But, uh, you know, uh, talking to people in the industry, they've been uh, working towards this for a long time where essentially it would be a shipping container that would start making the pizza in the back and in the front, the pizza as you ordered it would just come out. And I mean, how often are the humans there to actually fix your problem? See, I think you still will need human beings there for like a quality control perspective in case something goes sideways. I, I don't agree. think you could ever be completely lights out, but I like the automated ordering thing. Yeah. One of the places we always go is Culver's. Mm -hmm. Man, you know what the lines are in that place trying to get stuff. And you know, it's not complicated stuff. If I could step up to a kiosk and punch it in and go sit down and wait for it to be delivered, that would be better. Yeah. Um, no disrespect to the Culver's workers out there. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. I mean, quality control perspective. It has been my experience going to restaurants and fast food places in the last six months to a year that they don't ever get it right. Okay, but David, if there's not a human in McDonald's, there is going to be ketchup everywhere. <laughs> that, like, you don't think that people are going to do horrible things to that restaurant? Oh, no, I'm, I'm talking about not even being in the restaurant. Oh, you're talking about the cleanliness of the restaurant? And just like um, people will just yeah. be like, oh, I'm gonna, uh, yeah. people throw their food on the ground. Like, it just, I, there's... There has to be some level of humanity there. Otherwise, oh, no. the little burger Roomba is going to come and get it. <laughs> That's the noise a burger Roomba makes. No one's going to be uh, respectful. They might just need like some stray of, dogs in there. Of the robot. <laughs> um, I was have to say, though, David, you are absolutely cursed because I think you have more horror stories from these types of businesses than anybody else. Any, bus well, any business. But it's yeah. not I mean, it's not a horror. It's not a horror story. I'm just saying that whenever I go to Taco Bell. Like I started, or because the uh, one thing my kids will reliably eat are twists and a soft mm -hmm. taco with just meat and cheese. And so I order those two things first now because they are at the top of the receipt. You, those are the first two things you have to check off. Yesterday, I ordered twists, soft tacos, and then a, let's say 19 to 20 more things. <laughs> but <laughs> what did they forget? Like, and I, uh, and during COVID, they would seal the bag with yeah. that sticker like that massive sticker. And so you're like, had to rip the top off, no twist. And then you bang on the window. It's like, please, did you not hear my kids? Like they, they chant twists, twists, twists. Okay. But until they get it, you think a robot is going to hear the chant? No, I think that then... a robot will make sure that it's checked everything in the bag. And in the event that the robot miss my twists, I can just say twists, missing, missing. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll just give me another one. I don't because think... it'll have such a you know. David has picked a side yeah. in the human robot war. Yeah, he and is he just robots. positioning himself right now All to right. be their their underling. And I just mean, run things for the robots. I'll say that they're really nice at Taco Bell. They're very nice, and they're always like, "Oh, so sorry." It's like every time. I can't believe you turned your back on us so quickly. The yeah. war hasn't even started, and you've already betrayed us. I know it's crazy. You yeah. like? Are, I feel like you're anti job. I mean, you're anti human. Humans really never have anything going for them, anyways. <laughs> We better All move right. on. We better move on. All right. Our next most popular story this week. Hyundai subsidiary in Alabama accused of employing children. According to a recent Reuters report, a majority owned unit of Hyundai Motor Company, Smart Alabama, has been employing children as young as 12 years old. The plant produces stamped metal parts and assemblies. Local authorities learned of the plant's practice of employing underage workers after a Guatemalan migrant child went missing in February. 
The girl, who was 13, had been working at Smart along with her 12 and 15-year-old brothers. The siblings are part of a large group of underage workers who have worked for the supplier over the last few years. At the facility, which has a history of safety violations, children workers were, forge, uh, were foregoing school to work longer shifts. Now, Smart denied the allegations, and Hyundai said it, quote, does not tolerate illegal employment practices at, NA, at any Hyundai entity, entity. Many of the miners were hired through recruitment agencies, and one former worker claimed that there were about 50 underage workers across different shifts when he worked there. To make matters worse, local law enforcement, who uncovered the underage workers, doesn't have jurisdiction to investigate labor law violations. Federal and state law prohibits anyone under the age of 18 to work in metal stamping and pressing plants. And I know this story has a lot to unpack, and none of it's good. No, we talked about this story a lot in the office and um, we cover this industry, right? So we've seen lots of instances of companies skirting regulations in every area, but this was still shocking to me mm -hmm. uh, to consider that there were maybe 50 plus kids working in this plan at one point and no one's really saying anything. And I can only assume that that's out of fear of retribution or maybe because they felt that the families desperately needed this income and that they didn't feel it was their place to speak out. I don't know why. But the reality is that these kids were being exploited. And this is different from helping your parents in their small business after school or having a paper route in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, this is more than teaching kids how to be responsible. Yeah, this is a stamping plant. This is a stamping plant. They were missing school. Um, they were, you know, they were working in a place that had a history of amputations, safety violations, fines, all kinds of stuff. Um, the children that were called out in this article were described as migrants, which means that they were almost certainly undocumented. Mm -hmm. So even if Smart was using a staffing agency, which it sounds like they were, um, Hyundai and Smart, I think, have a responsibility to keep their head up about this. Um, cause you can't tell me that people didn't know that's hard for me to believe. Mm -hmm. And you know, if there's, if, if, if smart, when smart denied the allegations, they said that they didn't knowingly hire anyone who was not of legal age to work in their factory. You need to know, mm -hmm. you know, you need to have that paperwork, um, in place. You can't rely on a staffing agency to just say that this is okay. And for whatever reason, I, I don't know what the relationship was there or the culture there that the staffing agency thought that this was something that they could get away with. Mm -hmm. To me, that means that the people at Smart or at Hyundai were turning a blind eye to it. Um, and to me, I think it's possible that what they'd be fined for this is not enough of a deterrent. And perhaps the Department of Labor needs to beef up their penalties to deter this from happening elsewhere. Because if we look at the job market now, there's lots of worker shortages. If if companies are inclined to do this to address that, um, I think we might be seeing more of this. Um, and if we're hoping that there's going to be enough PR backlash to be a deterrent in this case, look at this story. Uh, you know, nobody's boycotting Hyundai. Mm -hmm. No, it was like a blip nationally. Honestly, this story. Yeah, it dropped um, on a Friday afternoon and kind of went away. Yeah, and despite these allegations being, to me, jaw-dropping, I don't think it got very much attention at all. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because the news cycle right now is full of crazy stuff. We know that. Like, like just there's a lot of horrible, crazy things happening in the world. But for whatever reason, this got overlooked. This cannot continue to happen. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, just to me, this is just like shocking and horrifying. And somebody at the Department of Labor needs to take some steps to make sure that this isn't happening again. No, and I agree with Mark Waterman, who is uh, watching us live. He says somebody needs to go to jail. And I think many somebodies need to go to jail because I understand that you can see a mature 15 year old and like walk past them in a plant and be like, eh, but he's 18 or like 17, you know, uh, or like 18, I guess we gotta be 18 to work there. But a 12 year old, like there's no way you walk past a 12 year old in a stamping plant and think that seems normal and everyone's complicit. And you talk about fear of retribution. It sounds like there's a greater fear because of deport deportation. So, you know, you're putting your entire family at risk if you try and be a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, uh, your thoughts on what was happening at SMART? The answer to all of those things that Anna brought up, it doesn't matter. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. It's a 12 year old kid mm-hmm. working in a stamping plant. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. And what, what made me see red is when you read comments from people who worked in the facility. Okay, mm-hmm. smart's wrong, way wrong. Yeah. People working there knew this was going on. Yeah. Did nothing. Step up. Step up. Here's the thing. Here's the other thing, too. And nobody's going to talk about this or want to say it. The reason this didn't make the news cycle, it's a 12 year old kid from Guatemala. Mm-hmm. If this is a white homeless kid from in that area, this is a different story. Oh, yeah. This was a migrant worker. This was somebody who was undocumented. Well, ship him back. This mm-hmm. is over and done. And it's going to continue to happen. Here's another reason it's going to continue to happen. This is straight from the Department of Labor's website. Violators of the child labor provisions are, of this, they're talking about the Fair Labor Standards Act, are subject to a civil monet- money penalty of up to $10,000 for each employee who is subject to a violation. Employees who willfully or repeatedly violate the minimum wage or overtime pay requirements are subject to a civil money penalty of up to $1,000 for each violation. Ten grand is the penalty for, are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. And if you do it again, hey, it's another thousand bucks. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. There's no teeth here. Mm-hmm. So shame on this company for not caring. Yeah. Shame on these coworkers for not saying anything. And shame on the Department of Labor for being an absolute wuss about trying to enforce this. Yeah. That's where everything fell down. Yeah. Amen. Everything fell down everywhere. And and it's your point earlier. You can you can't you can blame nearly everything else on a labor shortage. Not this. This mm-hmm. is just not acceptable. And Jeff, to your point, that the coworkers are what probably anger me the most. Yeah. Because a lot of times it takes when something's wrong in a factory, it's the workers who have to do something about it. Um until something like a headline like this forces its hand. But I mean, Smart and Hyundai should have come out and said a little bit more than just like it's not on us. You know, we like it's not a staffing agency. Trying to act like you didn't know. Shame on Hyundai. They yeah. had an opportunity here to do the right thing. And they could have gotten praised up and down for finally for seeing something that was wrong and taking action. They chose to do nothing. Yeah. Cut all ties with the recruitment agencies. Like figure out a way to penalize them. Like, uh, but, you know, if you're beholden to them, it's just a slap on the wrist and hopefully it goes away. Right. Um, the other thing was that, uh, well, I mean, um, what they're going to do is just pass the buck which mm-hmm. I was surprised they haven't done yet. Um, and hopefully if it gets a little bit more attention or maybe somebody at least gets a $10,000 fine instead of well, going for to jail. each incident. Yeah. How many of these are you going to be able to prove? These yeah. are all illegal immigrants. They're yeah. gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. It's just a very frustrating story all around. And uh, hopefully something is done. Where was it? It was Alabama, right? Yeah. Montgomery, Alabama. Mm-hmm. That was the other thing that was uh, troubling to me is that uh, trying to just say that it was, you know, a subsidiary and kind of like trying to put a little distance there. Didn't the story say that they're like essentially next to each other? Well, it's owned by Hyundai. It's a, yeah, it's a, but it's, I mean, like it's, a majority owned subsidiary of Hyundai. So it's a Hyundai company. Yeah, it's a Hyundai company. But like you could even a little bit of ignorance if it was on the other side of the nation, you mm-hmm. know, sure. but yeah. if it's on the same campus or if it's a minor component. These are the frames. Mm-hmm. Yeah. These are the, these are the car. This is the frame of the car. Yeah. And I mean, these are people that are coming in and out of there every day on this Hyundai campus. I mean, not just the people in the factory, but it's just like, hey, you guys notice that over at Smart, they have like a lot of bring your kid to work days. Just crazy. Horrible. All right. Well, we're going to depart a little bit for our most popular story this week and discuss a trash fence. A trash fence that catches a garbage tsunami heading downriver. In part three of Ben Munson's Trash Trilogy, he covers the Ocean Cleanup, a nonprofit environmental engineering organization that identified the Rio Motagua in Guatemala as a river that sends an estimated 20,000 metric tons of plastic into the Caribbean Sea every year. This one river is responsible for 2% of the plastic in the oceans. Ocean Cleanup recently developed an 8-meter-tall interceptor trash fence. Designed to contain trash upstream before it can hit the ocean and disperse, the fence uses technology common in avalanche and landslide protection systems. The idea is to catch the trash during flood season and then wait for water levels to recede before moving the garbage pile with excavators. In a video showing the interceptor trash fence in action, a shocking amount of garbage rages down the river before it's trapped by the fence. Now, it's not all good news. The trash fence has failed because the river actually erodes the river base below the fence. But 
ocean cleanup engineers are working to optimize the design and figure out just how many trash fences it'll take to keep all or most of the plastic from making it to the sea. Jeff, did you see the video of this filthy river? It's disgusting. As hard as the last story was to read and process, Mm -hmm. that was just as like stomach turning to watch all that just flowing down that river. That Mm -hmm. was hard. You know, this this organization, Ocean Cleanup, I think this is my new favorite charity. I like this, what they're doing here. You feel see a lot of these organizations that are very good at pointing out the problem and trying to raise awareness, which is important. I'm not trying to downplay that. Mm-hmm. These folks are not only doing that, they're actually trying to do something. Yeah, they're mm-hmm. engineers. They've, they've, they've identified that 80% of river plastic or plastic that gets to the ocean comes from about a thousand different rivers throughout the U.S. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to okay. implement this type of technology. Now, a thousand rivers is a lot, but it feels like... You can get after that. Like yeah. that's that's something that's that's palatable. You you feel like that's a reasonable goal. So that's what they're doing with this. They've also got some um, vehicles that they have on the water that are collecting trash, and they're focused on all of these rivers that are contributing. Like I said, eighty percent of this plastic to the ocean. Mm-hmm. So if we can get behind this, I mean, this is a viable solution. I think what we saw in the video and what we talked about here. It's the thing that leads to the thing, right? It's yeah. a great first step. Well, actually, this is the second step. They right. had one before this. So I, I I was just really impressed. And again, I'm just going to give them a plug. If you're interested in helping them out, it's um, theoceancleanup.com backslash donate. And I know I'm going to because, like I said, they've got a viable solution here mm-hmm. that is actually going to have a real impact on something that's such a huge, huge issue right now. Yeah, and to your point, they're trying to address – they're trying to get an interceptor trash fence on these 1,000 heaviest polluting rivers. Um, Anna, I thought it was interesting because a lot of times, you know, we talk about the R&D side of engineering, like mm-hmm. uh, the stuff that, you know, eventually we're going to see hit the market or we see stuff that's already in the market. This is something that, you know, they took a real world, world problem, made a solution. It worked mostly and they're making tweaks and hopefully it could be implemented in the near future. Money, money, I said, you know, hopefully. Right, the yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can be definitely a a drag um, to think about, you know, pollution and the climate crisis and all that stuff every day. It's in our face. And so when you see stuff like this that you feel like can really make a difference and it's being developed and they're, you know, working out the kinks like that's that's exciting. Um, And I think it's a great example of approaching this problem from multiple sides. That's what I like about it is more of a preventative tool. I mean, we've seen other ocean plastic mitigation efforts that are taking place um, after it's already there yeah. in the ocean, like big nets and boats and things like that, that pull the stuff from big bodies of water. But obviously there's risk in it being there in the first place, yeah. both to, you know, marine life, birds, um, as well as some of the toxins that leach from those plastics into the water. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we can identify these major arteries for ocean trash and kind of get ahead of it, that's exciting. That's, that's a really cool, uh, product. Um, I'm also going to take this opportunity to make my pitch about plastic. Um, the vast majority of single use plastic does not get recycled. Mm -hmm. And if you think this doesn't apply to you because you dutifully throw your plastic in the recycle bin, that's not really what it's about. (laughs) It's after... You know, many municipalities have kind of had to reduce their budgets related to recycling program capabilities and capacities. Um, Wrong types of plastics get in the wrong areas and whole bags of recyclables get pitched. I mean, it happens every day. Mm -hmm. We used to export a lot of our plastic to other countries who would utilize those materials. They don't want our plastic anymore. So there's a big glut between what's being used and our capacity to actually recycle it. Um, And the best thing that we can do is use less single use plastic. And I'm not coming here from like a high horse. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that it's inevitable that we have to use plastic because it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everybody uses it to package their goods. So it's, you know, but if you can scale it back, think about what you can do. If it's bringing up your own reusable cup and not buying bottled water, whatever you can do, Mm -hmm. um, it, it does make a difference because there's just so much of it out there. So Anyway, try to come back if you can. That's my, <laughs> <laughs> my, my pitch on plastic. No, that was, uh, I had switched to uh, bringing my own containers for water, stuff like that, mm-hmm. just because um, we when we would travel a lot, that was when it really hit me as to like how many water bottles I was buying, you know, uh, one at the airport, one on the plane, in the hotel. And I was just going through a lot. And, uh, you know, you start bringing that around. I know that my family is probably annoyed by it because like, oh, here's David in his blue jug again. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to dirty a dish. Well, I actually give my kids a lot of credit. I mean, like in the schools and stuff, they've got more um, access to like, not bubblers, water dispensing, yeah. you know, uh-huh. um, stuff like that. So they're always carrying around um 
you know, a, a water bottle, mm-hmm. which is something that just isn't in my brain. You grab a bottle of water or something like that if you're going someplace. So hopefully those paradigm shifts will help. I agree with you 100 percent, Anna, especially because when you look at single use plastics where it's not going to die down and where we would have a very difficult time controlling the use is like medical applications, mm-hmm. pharmaceutical right. applications. You need the durability of plastics there and the, the chemical resistance or excuse me, the bacteria resistance and all that. That's what plastics do. Yeah. So. But we can cut down everywhere else. Right. Keep mm-hmm. it in medical. Right. Um, one thing about the story is that it was all unlicensed waste dumping, and uh, which obvious, but uh, I just find there to be a shocking lack of waste management in the U.S. and globally. Um, you talk about how things are here in Madison, just in terms of uh, recycling programs getting cut back. Uh, we've done redid the story a few uh, weeks ago, months ago, on wish cycling, which is a big part mm-hmm. of the problem: people recycling things that aren't recyclable. But when we go up north, when we go to the cottage. Uh, there's the dump, right? There isn't waste right. collection. You go to the dump. And uh, I'll use the 4th of July as uh, as an example. 4th of July weekend, really busy in the north woods of Wisconsin. Go to the dump after a long weekend. And, uh, you know, I've got bags of garbage and I have bags of recyclable materials, right? And uh, he's just like, uh, the one dump says, recycling's full. Just take it home with you. Just take it home and bring it back. And it's like, I'm not going to leave 10 bags of like recyclables in the garage, uh, you know, until we come back in a month. Mm-hmm. That is gross. Mm-hmm. But then you go back to, you go to the other dump site. He says, just throw it all in the garbage. So it's like, at what point does waste management just need to get better? It's, I mean, get a few more receptacles, you know, um, crush your, I mean, sometimes it's as simple as uh, uh crushing cans, you know, crush cans. So it's not taking up so much uh, space, but I just couldn't believe how logistically <clears throat> flawed waste management still is. Well, and that's here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, looking at some stats here, the U S is actually like the eighth worst contributor to ocean plastics. Yeah. The top other, the top five are in Asia. Yeah. Okay. So if it's bad, that bad here. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine what it's like in other places that we really have to also put more resources towards globally. Yeah. Um, when you look at, again, those thousand rivers, the vast majority were looking at Africa and Asia for, yeah. for contributing to ocean plastics. So what kind of infrastructure mess are they dealing with mm-hmm. there and trying to do Totally. This well, and just, it's not something that you have to learn. It's like some weird connection that you have with nature where if you pollute, even accidentally, you know, like something flies off the boat or you drop something in the water, <clears throat> you innately feel like you've done something bad. I mean, and maybe that's just like a lifelong messaging on pollution. See, I, th- I don't, think, but I don't like, think that's universal, unfortunately. I don't, I don't know. I feel like these people that are throwing paint cans in the Rio Matagua, should like, <laughs> or maybe it's just what's always been done. Maybe it's what's always been done. But most importantly, if you guys want to make sure that you catch parts one and two of Ben <laughs> Munson's trash trilogy, he also had the Trash Mountain story in Everett, Washington that we talked about, mm-hmm. the powder keg of trash. And uh, he also had the sexy talking trash can, which <laughs> tries to entice people to recycle by talking dirty to them. Yeah, it, that one got a lot of views. Yeah. Don't need to, can't can't repeat anything that trash can says. Yeah. Salacious. Salacious. Trash can's got a filthy mouth. How long have you been trying to work that word into the podcast? Salacious. Yeah. I don't know, it just came to me. felt good. Yeah. David, David, do you think the state of uh, waste management in the U.S. went downhill after Tony Soprano died? <laughs> um, you know, I think it's really up in the air. You know, I, I think it was inconclusive at the end. <laughs> Got it. Um, all right. Well, before we move on to In Case You Missed It, we have another word from our new sponsor, Red Zone. Manufacturers are facing extraordinary challenges today. With labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and a changing workforce, complex industrial technology doesn't cut it on the front line. What's needed is a new way of working that will not only meet throughput goals, but change the shop floor culture to one of winning, where every worker feels they play a part in achieving the company's goals for success. What's needed is Red Zone, the connected workforce solution. And we're back. And just a reminder that Red Zone's connected workforce software solution enables manufacturers to empower frontline teams in production, maintenance, and quality to contribute their full potential and achieve company goals around productivity and throughput. Red Zone software enables manufacturers, big and small, 
to boost their plant's productivity, increase employee engagement, and lower turnover. See, Jeff, it still sounds good. Well done. All right. Let's move on. You didn't work salacious in there, though. (laughs) Talk to Red Zone, see if you can figure something out there. All right. We'll we'll work work on the script. Um, All right. Let's move on to In Case You Missed It. The stories that maybe weren't as popular on the website, but still stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. Um, Anna, what's your In Case You Missed It this week? Uh, so I selected a, an update on a story that we recently discussed on the podcast, um, which has to do with the Panasonic deal um, brokered by the state of Kansas in the town of DeSoto. Mm-hmm. Um, the company is planning to invest $4 billion in a factory to make batteries for EVs and will employ 4,000 workers in theory. Uh, so in exchange for this project, the state has approved uh, taxpayer funded incentives of $829 million, which we discussed last week. And um, the interesting thing that we've learned since is there are some details within this deal that were not exactly clear at the beginning when we first reported on it. But the Kansas City Star is saying that the state's economic development package does not require Panasonic to actually create any jobs or offer a certain wage in order to receive the funding that they have been promised. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is, however, a stipulation that Panasonic spend at least a billion dollars in building its factory in order to receive the incentives, and it must stay for 15 years. Despite this, the lack of job requirements was so unorthodox that some experts were scratching their heads, including Nathan Jensen, who's a government professor at the University of Texas, Austin. He studies these types of economic development incentives. He said that the lack of wage and labor standards was, quote, shocking, and that this is economic development 101. Mm. Um, I don't really know what to say besides uh, this lack of specifics. Sort of feels like states are engaging in a race to the bottom. I realize that the company... um, being forced to commit to building that factory, investing a billion dollars, staying for 15 years is something. But, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring up Foxconn again, because it was very close to us here in Wisconsin, but we saw Foxconn set up shop in Wisconsin and employ a handful of people that were described as like pushing brooms around these facilities. Yeah. As a way- Barely paid interns. Barely paid interns, just kind of in the building with nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think this is Panasonic's intention, of course, but if there's a loophole and they need to use it, you know that they will. Yeah. Um, And in Wisconsin, you know, it was that jobs requirement that allowed the state to largely back out of their commitments to provide all this tax um, incentive and funding to Foxconn once that deal started to, it became clear that it was shady and was not going to work out. So I don't know, like, does this pretend more bad deals where states win out because they provide bigger dollar amounts and fewer stipulations? Like, and is that where we want to go? Mm-hmm. Um, as we go down this path of like increasingly outsized and, and kind of crazy eco- economic development incentives. Um, I mean, you know, I've, I think anyone who watches this podcast know that, that i personally find some of these deals to be a little bit suspect and I don't know how well they work out in the end. Right. But I think that these states get really overzealous, especially when it's a competitive environment and they're trying to compete for these jobs. But the numbers that are going out these days on these packages and and the lack of checks and balances, I think in this one specifically, is a little bit concerning to me. Mm-hmm. Well, and you're right, the job requirement, it didn't... Uh Foxconn didn't go away, but they were allowed to renegotiate the deal. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're going to promise a $4 billion factory and 4,000 workers, I feel like you could put a safety net of 500 on there or something. When you look at the equation that is standard, it's, all right, this much capital investment, this many jobs equals we pay this much. And then they break it down to how much they're paying per job over the course of, you know, however many years. Uh, I do like that, you know, they have to stay for 15 years, but likely what's going to happen is they'll wind up paying these incentives. And, you know, so what after 15, they'll pay the incentives for 15 years. And then if uh, they don't make good on the deal after 15 years, the state's going to what? Ask uh, Panasonic to pay them back. I don't think there's a clawback 
in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that they that would just be them hitting yeah. the mark. So oh, okay, but I mean, they have to be paying those incentives before they hit the fifteen year mark. Oh yeah. So yeah. my point, yeah, is yeah. that they could. I mean, I don't think this is their plan to like build a billion dollar factory and operate an empty building for fifteen right, years. Right. Like obviously, that's not what anyone wants. Right. I'm just saying that like there are some risks inherent in this deal that I feel like it could have been better structured. Yeah, Jeff, the the magic beans just they keep <laughs> the beans they keep sprouting. Know. Yeah. There is a lot there is way too much ready fire aim type stuff going on with these. I would agree. I think we have that Foxconn shaded glasses oh. that we're looking at with this stuff so we're more suspect and more yeah. critical of these deals, but it's fair. And I think when you look at the job guarantees, you would like to see something. I think what I would like to see is not just a number of jobs. I want to see jobs paying no less than salary. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so you can't, one. you can't do the broom pushing intern guy. Okay. Yeah. You need to make sure that if you're creating jobs, whatever the number is, there's a minimum number and they're paying at least this much. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, what's needed here. I think there may have been a little bit more comfort with being loose because Panasonic is a sort of consumer facing brand as well. Mm -hmm. In this case, that's not what they're doing. They're not building consumer electronics or batteries or anything. Well, like EV batteries, yeah. but it's not for consumer devices. So there was probably a little bit more comfort there because if they do back out, they could see more backlash just hurt the brand. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Whereas a Foxconn, you know, it's kind of tied to Apple, but only for those They're, in the know. Yeah. Um, but you're right. That is another, that's another stipulation. That's also very common in these is yeah. that it has to hit, they have to hit a job number uh, with a certain salary over a certain amount of time and even with certain benefits. So, I mean, and then a lot of that, you know, states will also kick in um, training costs, stuff like that, upskilling employees. Um, so it is, it is weird. It's a really weird deal. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, this deal's an onion. We're and just... Panasonic's, <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's layers. Mm -hmm. yeah. The beans produced an onion. The beans yeah. are onions, guys. Wow. It's just canned onions. Oh, man. That is mm. deep. Gross. <laughs> I like our simultaneous gross. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> My, in case you missed it this week, was awesome because I picked... <laughs> <laughs> this story came out on like Monday. We posted it. And I, as soon as I read the story, I'm like, that is my in case you missed it. Boom. Pasted it in the document. And right after I did that, uh, a listener of the podcast, William Brent, emailed me the exact same story and said, this looks like something that'd be right up your alley. I'm like, I, you have no idea what just happened. Like he was blowing my mind. I'm trying to tell everybody in the office and they're like. Neat. Man, you almost, almost punched something there. I know. Excited. I was like, I was, I'm so fired up. Anyway, so uh, mine, in case you missed it, uh, <laughs> via <laughs> William Brent, thank you, uh, rice engineers are turning dead spiders into hydraulic grippers. Rice University mechanical engineers have found a way to convert the bodies of dead wolf spiders into necrobotic grippers. That's right. That's a new gripper called a necrobotic gripper. Doom and gloom. All right. In a recent study, researchers used a gripper, a.k.a. a dead spider, to lift a jumper and break a circuit on an electronic breadboard, turning off an LED. According to the researchers, the spider, after it's dead, is the perfect architecture for small-scale, naturally-derived grippers. The lab specializes in soft robotic systems that use non-traditional materials. The spiders can lift more than 130% of their own body weight, body weight and sometimes much more. Now, this one was a little shady because I didn't know if it was like a post post-mortem body weight or like a living body weight because I mean that's going to that's going to be a big difference. Oh, a little sh shrinking. Yeah, yeah shrinking you know? sh spider, yeah. Uh it all started when this team found a dead spider in the hallway and wondered why do spiders crawl up, curl up when they die? Yeah. Which is crazy. Basically spiders use hydraulics to power their muscles. And when they die, they curl up. So the team wanted to find a way to leverage that mechanism. They glued a needle to the dead spider's head, injected a little air into it and voila, natural gripper. The spider was built to last and went through 1,000 open-closed cycles. And that's after it lived a full spider life. <laughs> now, they say this could be useful in pick-and-place applications. And bonus, they're biodegradable. No more waste out there. Yeah. 
This story is incredible. The prospect of necrobotic rippers <clears throat> is a little terrifying. Luckily, as humans, we don't have hydraulic muscles. So luckily, we won't have air pumped into our brains to use us uh, once we're dead. But you never know. I don't know. Your robot overlords might figure out a way. They but will. You're on their team, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, when they're already <laughs> growing you in the pods. Yeah. I mean, they. I feel like they're going to do the right thing. They will. You're just getting as much on record as you can, huh? I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Hold on. We're, t we're talking into the internet, right? Dear <laughs> robot, dear AI master, overlord, <laughs> I always thought you made a superior burger and fries. Um, did either of you guys get a chance to read this story? And what are your thoughts on leveraging dead spider tech? I did read it. I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Really, just even the minds of these researchers to yeah. look at that and think, hmm. What can and we do with that? That's so you amazing, know? yeah. Um, and I always wonder, too, why do spiders curl up like that? So that was oh. kind of interesting to learn. As far as applications, it'll be interesting to see where they go with this. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, you've covered all the different stuff involved with it. There's not really much more to bring out there. But, yeah, amazing development. Yeah. And spiders, really, I mean, we've look at all the stuff they're doing with different spider silks, too, in terms oh. of materials. So really kind of amazing creatures. No, I am constantly fascinated and I cover a lot of stories with bioengineering, right? You know, nature inspired engineering. I never thought it would be dead nature <clears throat> engineering um, or just using dead nature. But uh, I mean, it's way better than just, you know, sweeping it up and tossing it in the wastebasket. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like I'm not comfortable with the fact that we already have a word necrobotic for yeah. dead things robots because called like second life spiders or something no, I mean. well, new life the new life spider yeah. or like can't this just be like a one off thing do we need a word for it to like <laughs> enable future <laughs> dead things robots oh man think of Fair. all the kids listening to this right now that could be like you know what I'm going to major in necrobotics necrobotics oh. it's a new thing red flag those kids your yeah. university already <laughs> has a program in place i think i think part of it is they needed a term because you know it was uh published in a journal and so they had to be you know a new breakthrough in necrobotics i mean if that is the headline you've got me just i will buy the journal how much for that article yeah. and then i read it and i'm like Sad future coming. Sad future. Yeah. Well, you wanted this future. So enjoy your trip to McDonald's <laughs> when a dead spider oh, is man. like flipping dead your spider burger. Grippers, bringing yeah. out your happy meals. If a dead spider can make sure the twists are in the bag and actually given their very soft, their very soft touch, they probably won't break them either. You know what? I like this. Taco Bell. Yeah. Get in the necrobotic game. Yeah, you got a complaint? Take it up with my manager. He's a dead spider. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, the conversations I'll have with a dead wolf spider. <laughs> Jeff, what is your In Case You Missed It This Week? All right. Might be opening a real can of worms over here on this one. So oh. we'll see. My story is about um, North Dakota basically wanting to do a new security review for a Chinese firm that is opening up a new um, corn mill. So basically, about a year ago, this company, Fufeng Group, they're from China, or basically it's Fufeng USA. It's the U.S. subsidiary of a company that is owned, or a Chinese company that's, and the Chinese government does own part of this company, mm -hmm. okay? But not the U.S. subsidiary. They are planning a $700 million wet corn milling plant in, just outside Bismarck, North Dakota, okay? So initially, there were some concerns because the, the there's going to be about... $96 million worth of infrastructure investment. People were cool with that. There was about a 15-year, 15, 15, 20 20-year deal in terms of tax abatements. They were cool with that. But once they started digging into this company and a lot of the locals learned that it was a Chinese company that owned it, mm -hmm. this concern was the fact that this facility, which is about 370 acres in an agribusiness park, um, was also about 15 miles away from a U.S. Air Force base. Right. So they're worried that somehow... This this food processing plant could essentially be there for no other reason than to steal secrets from this Air Force base, which does do a lot of unmanned missions. So there is some sort of high tech stuff going on at this local Air Force base. But that's the reason that there's all this local um, backlash now for this facility that could employ like 200 people. It's a seven hundred million dollar investment they're looking to make to get this plant up and going. It's basically to process corn. They talked to the guy who runs the U.S. subsidiary. He said, we're going to buy corn here in the U.S. We're going to mm -hmm. make everything here in the U.S. And we're going to sell everything here in the U.S. It is a U.S. subsidiary of a Chinese company. 
They have no contact with the Chinese government. The FBI has vetted the company and <laughs> basically said, yeah, I think it's just a corn mill. Yeah. But there is still all of these folks in this area. And now it has gone, kicked it up the ladder. There's a letter sent to a number of senators. Oh, the God. two North Dakota senators, Marco Rubio is involved because it's a Chinese company. And all of this is going on, even though the local officials are like, it all sort of checks out. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. we feel pretty good about this. There's another Chinese company, an aerospace company, probably about an hour's drive away that started working um, in the state, I don't know, like 10 years ago. They've grown and done stuff. And it's an aerospace company. <laughs> yeah. If anyone's going to steal aerospace there hasn't been any issues secret. there. <clears throat> There's also a flight school not too far away from this where they have trained Chinese pilots. So there's all of this stuff, mm. but what's holding up this $700 million, 200 job corn mill project is fears over, over security because it's a Chinese company. Mm. So it just goes back to the, a lot of the stuff that was really started with, it's Huhai, right? I always say that name oh, incorrectly. Wa Huawei. Huawei. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My bad. No worries. That started there with the Trump administration being very concerned over the consumer electronics and their tie to the Chinese government and potential issues there. Uh, you know, we talked last week about that GPS connector is made by a Chinese company and security concerns there. So how much is this going to play a role going forward? If mm -hmm. it's a Chinese company that wants to, and we want these folks to come here, right? We, we want them to make things here in the U.S., but we're still paranoid over the fact mm -hmm. that it's a Chinese company and it's causing problems. You know what food processing doesn't need right now? Another conspiracy theory. Food yeah. processing has been suffering as a result of some coincidental things that we have talked about as normal, normal things that happen mm -hmm. doing business that have all been, everyone else that is a stakeholder in the industry says, no, it's all normal. But as a result of fanning the flames of conspiracy theories, I think is why we get stuff like this. Well, and the thing is, so I called it a food processing plant, which it is, but basically it makes, I guess you could call it like a binder that goes yeah. into a number of different food products. It goes into pharmaceuticals. It's used in a number of different industries. It's basically like a thickener, yeah. if you will. So the theory isn't even worrying like they're going to poison us. It's the fact that they're the proximity, again, to this Air Force base. It just seems like a reach, especially mm -hmm. after the FBI has been in there and seems to have vetted the company. And again, the guy running the show here is out of Chicago. Yeah. Okay. If you want to go after a Chinese company, if you have the energy for it, why not TikTok? You know, you want to talk yeah, about something with one. you want to talk about something with real vulnerabilities and harvesting information on its users. Maybe spend your time on that one. Yeah, and that's that's kind of where I'm caught here because there are definitely some of these companies we have to be careful with. Yeah, we talked about one last <laughs> week and who Huawei. Huawei. I don't know why I keep that's messing okay. that one up. There, that, like some of that seemed legit. I think it was a little bit overzealous at yeah. times, but there were legitimate concerns there. But again, we're going to start limiting our opportunities if we start getting this paranoid over all these companies. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we want to compete with China on a global level. Well, hey, if a Chinese company wants to come here and help us out a little bit with that, yeah. we also have to be open to that. Right. So. I wonder how many of the loudest people are employed. Um, Anna, your thoughts on, I didn't see, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't very familiar with this article. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on the potential security risks presented by this milling plant. I I, I agree with, with all that you guys have said pretty much. It's just, uh, it seems like a colossal waste of time and just sort of, um, I don't know if grandstanding is the right word, but it just seems like not necessary. Yeah. Well, Keyboard of, of all the reasons yeah. to put a mill on hold, again, 96 million in infrastructure, mm -hmm. tax abatements we were just talking about, potential environmental concerns, more traffic in this area, all of that, that's viable. Yeah. 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 Well, this one <laughs> seems like kind of a reach. I don't know. I know. And, and if, you know, if people want to get serious, like we all buy products produced in China every day. Yeah. We all provide, you know, to your point about social media, like your information is getting out there. These GPS devices, IT devices, that's the kind of stuff that you need to be more worried about. And in my opinion, like you, it, people don't blink an eye about country of origin when they buy at a retailer, they're not even thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we've got a problem with a wet corn plant, mm -hmm. uh, 15 miles away from an airport for space. Like that's I mean, that's not even close. It, it just well, and it's been there, it's been there for a while. And again, they are running probably some you know secretive type stuff because it is they're unmanned yeah. planes. But 
I don't know. Like, it's a big swing. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's a bit of a reach. I just hope that this story dies here and we don't see it in the next political cycle. Or That's like, part of you, the problem, though, right? You stood for the Chinese factory. It's like, oh, come on. Well, that's the problem. Like, the Republican governor in North Dakota was initially like, hey, this is great stuff. Jobs. Then everybody started raising this issue. And as soon as you say China and security and intelligence mm-hmm. concerns, then he's got a backpedal. Oh, so. boy. Well, on our previous story, we got another gem from uh, Mark Waterman who suggested – necrobotic burrito prep. Totally. That's what's coming for David's burrito. Yeah, but it's like, how are the robots going to lick the end of the burrito to seal it? Oh, does anyone lick the end of it? Only the good ones. Chipotle. Only the good ones. Yeah, I don't think Chipotle is licking burritos, bro. I mean, I got a guy. You got a guy. (laughs) He makes sure my burritos stick. Um, (laughs) uh, And Mark, actually, producer Alex says that not only is your idea solid, but necrobotic burrito prep Pre- Necrobotic Burrito Prep is a sick band name. <laughs> That's from Alex. And also likely his next venture in the arts. All right. Well, let's move on to our final thoughts before we get out of here. Anna, what's your final thought this week? Okay, so I just wanted to let you guys know that this might be my final week on the podcast because I learned this morning that my husband bought a Mega Millions ticket. <laughs> I was so afraid for a second. <laughs> oh, God. My heart is racing. I'm like, we don't even know what we're going to do. Anyway, go ahead. No, <laughs> I have nothing else to do. Um, um, uh, yeah, so I think like by the time this reaches you Monday, if you are getting this podcast in your Monday email deployment um, or online, uh, I'll know by then. Yeah. And then, and I feel like my odds are pretty good. They're good, right? Like yeah. my odds are good. I think it's okay. one in 302 million. Yeah, so I, feel, I feel good about that. Easy. I'm worried if Anna wins, like we're going to find out exactly what she thinks of all of us. <laughs> When we don't hear from Scorched her again, earth. I think we'll know. No. <laughs> I'm going to bring in burritos, and then after you guys eat them, I'll be like, I licked all those closed. <laughs> and I'd Suckers. say, thank you. See ya. That's why it's stuck. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. You know what? When you go to like, you're trying to eat the burrito the size of your head, and it blasts open on the back end, you're just like, no one licked this burrito. Sad. I don't even want that much money, honestly. Like, I can't even imagine like what that, I, ugh. Oh, but that Kind of turns my stomach. That is the whole fun part. I... Okay, I mean, that's my final thought, uh, is that I love getting caught up in it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you see the dollars, you see the, the odds, and you're just like, you go straight dumb and dumber, like, you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and now, no, I think Anna had the best line, like, you don't care when it's a measly, like, 15 million. Like, oh, why yeah. would you bother then? Right, yeah. don't bother. But now it's a yeah. billion? Oh, then I'll buy a ticket. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, and no matter, I mean, uh, I'm the type of person that buys a ticket just like only when it gets ridiculous, because I like to get caught up. I like to get caught up in the fanfare. And uh, I know that um, our coworker, Mitzi, he was planning on doing a pool, you know, the whole um, office throw in a couple bucks mm-hmm. to uh, get a bunch of tickets. And it was just fun thinking through like, man, how would that tear us apart? Yeah, Just we- like, <laughs> uh, boy, I bought the ticket, so I should really get 10% more. It's like we're talking about hundreds of millions each. You never paid me for those, so you're out. <laughs> Uh, but I, I do like, uh, and I'm glad that I just have another chance because on Tuesday I was doing my walk around the building and I wanted to go to the gas station and buy the tickets. I'm like, no, 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 there's time. There's time. But then life happens. All of a sudden I'm at softball and they're calling the numbers. Panic. And one, (laughs) one of of my numbers, one of the five numbers was mine. So I knew that mm-hmm. I'm close. I'm was the, it the Powerball or whatever? Because I think that one paid. Oh out. no, no, no! It was just a seven. <laughs> just a run of the mill seven. seven. Yeah, it was just my wife's July <laughs> birthday seven. But uh, oh. yeah, I mean, you got to play. You have to. That's another thing I enjoy is like the people just go and they do the quick pick. I like to just sit there with the little uh, fill in. The, you got to fill the circles in. I don't. I've like, never bought a lottery ticket. Really? I, yeah, I don't. Oh, know, I don't man. know how to even do it. It's like the old school Scantron sheets, and you just like fill in the numbers, and you're just thinking like, mm, I want to do Des's birthday, but then if I do, I got to do Caden's birthday. Do I do my dad's birthday? No. That's so not you're a good there's like a line behind you, and you're doing that. No, no, no. Code? Like people grab the little sheets, and then they go off into you know there's there's you no way they can see. It's kind of like. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You don't want anyone copying. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, there's normally like a designated area. People normally take them home because it takes a lot of thought. You know, they got to <laughs> open like random pages of a book and pick those numbers. But I'm on board. I'm on board. Uh, Jeff, you plan to win tonight? 
like Anna, I don't think I've ever bought one of those. Oh, um, man. Those types of tickets. So maybe. Not maybe even, I should. Mm-hmm. Maybe I got to get Today's on Today's the day. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what, what would happen. Been? What would happen if Anna and I both win? We have to split we're it. Just, we're out of here. And then David has to do the podcast yeah. past alone. I would support your decisions and then understand that you likely wouldn't listen anymore and trash you mercilessly. No, I'm just joking. I would actually probably. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like you had this planned out. <laughs> no, 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 no. I would just, you know, um, wish you good luck in future ventures and hope that you stuck around out of boredom after you spent the first 200 million. <laughs> But you know, I already came back. I'm back. I bought everything. I would, I would be the most boring billionaire. Or yes. millionaire Same, I know. Or well, just be, I, don't know. I would be a fun billionaire. That would, would be gone like fire. Just like <laughs> <laughs> you would have every action figure ever made. Oh man, before the before the uh, state or whatever cut cut me the giant check, it'd be gone. Just like I got 602 million in cash coming. Let's roll. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway, that would be frightening. Jeff, uh, final thoughts? A couple things here. First of all, we'll get the answer out. Nobody got the trivia question correct. Really? Yes. Everybody was betting on somebody else. The answer to the company in the last year that has had the most engagement due to their recalls, again, the options were General General Motors, General Mills, Sun Villa, Ford, um, Tyson. And the number one answer, or number one in terms of engagement, was actually General Motors. Um, mm-hmm. They had so they had a huge recall on their Bolt with some battery issues <laughs> starting on fire, and actually they also with their Silverado and some old SUVs. Mm-hmm. So it was a bit of a quantity thing there. So the correct answer was General Motors, and had a lot of people going uh, with Tyson, a lot of people going with Ford. Yeah, uh, but General Motors. Was I the was all answer. in with Tyson. I yeah. really thought that was it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to pause the trivia portion. Oh, okay. okay. I'm going to revamp this. I've got some ideas. I just need to work it through a little bit. So we're going to skip it this week. I'll be back shortly with that. <laughs> so okay. the trivia, the trivia this week is: Will Jeff come back with a short answer version of trivia, <laughs> a multiple choice, or true and false? No. <laughs> oh no, it's going to be much. Well, it'll be one of those. Whoa! Be like, yeah. yeah I mean, what is it going to yeah, be? It'll be something like that. I mean, I don't know what other options are. My closing thought was actually one of the nerdiest things that I enjoy is Shark Week. Oh, yeah. On the Discovery Channel. All week, week at week. my house. Oh, my God. I didn't get a chance yeah. to watch a lot of it because <clears throat> we were playing softball and stuff like that and stuff going on. But I definitely recorded all of it, DVR'd mm-hmm. it all. So I will be enjoying that. And one of the things that's actually pretty cool is a lot of the technology they use. The shows that I don't like the shows where they have like the guys from Jackass on there and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I don't get into that. What I like is when they're talking about like tracking them and figuring out what they're doing and where they're going and all this crazy stuff. And a lot of that technology you can see coming from the industrial sector. Like oh. it's got to be super durable. It's got to put up with a lot of different environmental factors. They also get into the environments that these sharks are in and what's going on affecting them. So a lot of the stuff that we talk about, you can definitely see a correlation to. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of cool to uh, to see as well. So we do have one trivia question, though. There is a person slash company we have not mentioned the entire time on this podcast, I think for the first time ever. Mm. You can say who that is. We will send you a T-shirt. Oh, every, oh that's an easy oh. one. Everyone knows. Yes. So let's get some T-shirts out there. I think they should know. Um, Like coming clean about never buying a lottery ticket. I don't know that I've ever watched Shark Week. See, the stuff, especially like when they have the ones on like Air Jaws where they're jumping mm-hmm. out of the way. I don't know. There's something about that. It's just yeah. engrossing. It I love is good. It. There's this really big plug by Sonic. They've got. Have you seen the commercials for this slushy that's got like shark gummies on the top? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like every minute of the break is about this slushy. So I didn't know if it was the restaurant or the hedgehog. <laughs> um, all right. Well, <laughs> before we get out of here on such a poignant note, <laughs> please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, <laughs> I think Mark just scored a shirt. He did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mark is quick. All right. Uh, finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first and subscribe to us on YouTube at IN Magazine and make sure that you can watch us live. All right. For Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.